Okay, here back to continue chapter two. I want to finish up now the, the chapter. Uh, let's get into our screen. All right, so a special sort of discussion, special section of chapter two deals with water. Right? And, and water is a very critical part of our planet, right? They say over 75% of our planet is covered in water. And also water is a primary molecule that makes up the human body. So about 70% of the body is made up of water. So a huge majority of the planet made in water, uh, made of water, the, the big part of our, um, our body made of water. It makes sense then that we learn a little bit about this water molecule. It's, um, it's, it's quite unique. Uh, it behaves differently than a lot of other molecules. It's kind of like a diva, if you will, very uh, just different, unique. Um, and a couple of reasons for this, right? It's uh, one, its shape. If you remember, it's not like a straight molecule. Pictures that you've seen, it looks kind of like a, you know, like a, like an angular type of molecule. It has two bonds that are both polar. So there is some polarity, some delta positive, some delta negative charges in water. Um, because of its polarity, it has the ability very easily to form hydrogen bonds. So between other water molecules or other different molecules. So with all this together, water does generate some interesting properties, right? And, and, and that's why we're gonna spend some time here. So there's a better picture of water. So it's not linear, it's not like a straight line. It's got that little angle to it. Um, this is how it looks in, in real life, right? So oxygen hogging up the electrons. So delta negative for the oxygen, delta negative for the oxygen, and then delta positive for both hydrogens. So polarity in both of those covalent bonds, uh, shape, uh, ability to form hydrogen bonds, all make water have some interesting qualities here. So that, yeah. All right. Now, I think you learned this like way back in elementary school, right? So the, the sort of the states of matter. Matter can exist in, on Earth in three physical states, a solid, a liquid, and a gas. Once we get up uh, to the sun, to other, you know, space, whatever, uh, we can have in this plasma state of, of matter. But again, if it's too hot for, for Earth here, right? So for us and planet Earth, uh, we know that matter exists in the solid state, in the liquid state, and the gas state. And what determines the, uh, the state uh, that it exists in is temperature. So at the hottest end, we have plasma. A little bit cooler, we have the gas state. A little bit cooler, liquid. And then the coolest state, we have solid. And basically what happens, temperature makes these, uh, the, the molecules move. So the hotter it is, the farther apart and faster these, these molecules are moving around. The atoms are moving around. As it gets a little bit colder, they're moving, but a little bit slower, closer together. As it gets really cold, they start to aggregate together. So think of yourself going outside uh, on a hot summer day. Uh, maybe you got out of the pool. Maybe you're walking on the hot sidewalk barefooted. You're not going to be walking slow. You're going to be walking very, very fast. It's hot. A lot of, lot of kinetic energy there. Uh, maybe on a cold day, right? You may not even like your pet that much or your significant other that much, but it's very cold and you want to snuggle because ah, I'm cold, right? So, so you get close together, right? If you have the air condition on and, and not enough blankets, you wake up, you're not going to be spread out. You're going to be in that little sort of fetal position. And, and that is uh, the idea. The colder it gets, things compress, 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 compress. And, um, and I don't know, maybe you males, you, you, you've jumped into that really, really cold swimming pool. And, and, and you know, things kind of compress and things kind of uh, uh, sort of aggregate together. Yeah. So um, that's a very, very uh, common situation in cold sort of temperature, that, that molecules will aggregate together. Uh, I just splashed this picture in there. I think it's kind of neat. Uh, I challenge you to find, you know, a bunch of other molecules that do this. But water 
exist naturally in all three physical states right here. So we have the solid ice, liquid water, and then that water vapor is it's uh, sort of these hot springs there. So not many other molecules on planet Earth can, uh, can you naturally find like that. So I thought that was kind of neat there. So physical states, again, we're talking about the high kinetic movement in the gas state, a little bit slower in the liquid state, and then the solid state. And this is weird, right? This is one of these weird uh, sort of different behaviors of water. So if you notice in the solid state, because of all the hydrogen bonding, uh, water actually expands in the solid state. So on the left, A, we would hypothesize that it would be even smaller, more compressed in the liquid state, but that's not true. So uh, water is actually more dense, it's more compact together in the liquid state than it is in the solid state, it has expanded. That's gonna have biological consequences. So because water expands when it freezes, we say water, or I should say ice is less dense than liquid water. It expands and it actually floats. So in English, we say that ice floats in liquid water. So the solid state floats on the liquid state. This is rare. In most other molecules, the solid state is more dense and the solid state sinks in its uh, liquid state there. So this has profound uh, biological effects. Um, it, it has an imp impact on temperature. Uh, if you live, uh, if we live on planet Earth, we have all this water. Um, you know, because ice doesn't sink to the bottom of the ocean, ice floats. So that has an impact on localized temperature. Um, if you can envision ice sinking to the bottom of the ocean, and 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 be very cold and dark down there so that would make other water freeze and other water freeze and other water freeze and instead of our oceans being so deep it would be this big sort of block of ice uh, and then a very very shallow ocean up top where the sun can can penetrate through so very very different um, situation for aquatic life for oceanic life um, and, and a lot of again weird things that things that would be very different if if water sank, or if I should say, if ice sank in liquid water. So the left, we have ice in water. Over here, we have liquid uh, alcohol and solid alcohol uh, that has sank in. And this is on the right. Most molecules behave this way. The solid is more dense. The solid sinks in liquid state. Here, the solid floats on the liquid state. So again, weird, weird, weird. And this is due to the expansion as it freezes. If you've ever left a soda can in the freezer for a little while, you forgot about it, you come back and that can has ruptured, right? That, it's that expansion of the water in that soda that, that causes that. So uh, that can have biological effects again, right? Not common in El Paso. We go up to Colorado, we go up to Oregon. You see this more often in the winter, right? This homeless guy fell asleep, passed out, uh, and you can see his sort of frostbite. Right? Frostbite is when the cells actually freeze, the water inside those cells freeze, water expands and it ruptures these cells. Right? So these cells are dead basically, they've been ruptured. So we have this dark necrotic tissue that happens. Right? See here on the bottom left, all those puffy fingers that have swollen, that have froze, and eventually that tissue is dead. That tissue starts to decompose, bacteria starts to aggregate, um, not safe to leave that on there, right? So they would have to go in there and amputate all of these digits there. So uh, that person's never ever gonna be able to give you a high five again, no, they're very sad. Uh, toes, right? You can see frostbite there, I don't know what happened there. Um, frostbitten fingers, uh, I don't know what's going on here, but stole these off the internet, but we have some frostbite happening on the toes. Uh, just not a good scenario. So uh, very rare again here in El Paso. I've never seen frostbite naturally here. I've seen two cases, not very bad, uh, but students messing around in the lab uh, at UTEP and they were working with liquid nitrogen. They were playing around and got liquid nitrogen splashed on their hand for too long. And basically they had some frostbitten tissue there, but 
and this is the biological significance of water expanding in biological systems. So it can happen in animal uh, humans, can happen in animals. So in the winter, when it gets cold, be sure bring your pets in. They can have frostbitten appendages, ears, uh, you know, feet. So be nice, be nice to your pets. Yep. Um, second weird aspect of water is the idea that water is very stubborn. Water doesn't change temperatures very easily. Uh, we say water has a very, very high specific heat. So this is a real, um, sort of from the realm of physics. Specific heat is defined as the number of calories needed to raise one gram of a substance one degrees centigrade. So in essence, how much energy has to be input to change the temperature of water? Uh, let's say I put, I don't know, you, maybe you're old school, you have the little ice, those little ice trays. So I, fill, I go fill up these little ice trays, go put them in the freezer. And some of you have the new you know, fancy automatic refrigerators with uh, ice makers, but if you're old school, you have the old ice trays so I fill these things with ice, I go put it in the freezer, and I have to wait a while, right? I have to wait, you know, I'm not, I can't have ice in, in five minutes. It's gonna take a long time for that water to change temperatures to get to the freezing point. And that's what we call specific heat. If I wanna boil water, I can't put water on the stove, low heat, and expect it to boil right away. I gotta crank up as much heat as possible, and let it sit there for a while to get all that heat to change the temperature of water. The high specific heat. Water's resistance to uh, changing temperatures. Now, um, again, this is important because, again, our body is primarily water, 70% water. So that's a good thing for us. If, if, if we weren't like, if water didn't behave like this and we go out on a cold day, uh, maybe we won't come back and maybe we stayed frozen out there or if water wasn't like this and we go out on a hot day uh, we overheat because our our water got too hot too rapidly so because we are primarily based out of water uh, we can tolerate going out into the cold going out into the heat and our body temperature and other homeostatic aspects kick in but our body temperature stays pretty close to to normal regardless of the external uh, temperature, yeah? so specific heat. Uh, another weird aspect of water is that water is sticky right? because of the hydrogen bonds. So water exhibits a high degree of cohesion. Water likes to stick to other water molecules. So uh, you can see here the little droplet of water in the faucet or something, there's that little bond that's holding there, holding this, this drop of water. So water cohesive properties. Uh, we can see this in, in different ways. Right here we see a little bug, some little water bug walking on water. Right? And how is this possible? See, how can this water bug walk on water? Well, because water is sticky, water is, is, is acting like a piece of glass, if you will, a piece of almost like ice, right? And if as long as there's not enough mass compressing down, not enough weight to puncture the water that that insect can walk uh, you know easily it's just like you're walking on a frozen lake right so as long as there's not enough weight puncturing down this thing can walk around easily we call this surface tension surface tension is linked back to the idea of cohesion so cohesion whereby water is a is exhibiting these sticky qualities there so surface tension uh, I found this on the web too. I, I, I thought this is a pretty neat picture. So exhibiting this surface tension, the stickiness of water. So here we have a swimmer that is, whoops, here the swimmer is kind of coming up. It seems like the swimmer is already sort of out of the water, but you can see that film of, of water covering the swimmer's body. So that tells us that water is this sort of sticky film that's still surrounding him there. Uh, if they were to take a breath, they're technically not out of underwater yet. Right? They're still technically underwater, even though they're above that surface of the water. They haven't ruptured, they haven't broken through that surface tension yet. So that is a, 
uh, an interesting quality that water exhibits. Uh, it can be used for different purposes. Plants utilize this to help pull water up the roots. So because water is sticky, I pull one water molecule and that pulls others along with it. And eventually we can pull water all the way up to the leaves from the roots. Right? So interesting uh, aspect, capillary action because of the water's cohesive properties here. Uh, something that's uh, important maybe for, for humans, let's say a baby is born too premature and there's too much liquid inside of these, these little air sacs. Uh, a baby born premature might, might have to be given a supplemental uh, pressurized oxygen because they would inhale. If they're not getting help breathing, when they exhale, water on this surface would bond with water on this surface. So these two, these air sacs open and then they would seal up together. Right? And it would take a lot of effort to inhale, inhale, inhale to open up that airway, which would just close again the next time. So the, the little baby would fatigue, they, they, would, they can't keep that up for very long. So we have to pressurize, keep these air sacs open uh, and, and allow them to, uh, to breathe until eventually they get stronger uh, the air sacs get a little bit bigger and they don't have that same problem. We have some other chemical surfactant and other things that are deposited in there that, that minimize that, that cohesive uh, sort of aspect there. So, uh, so I hope this is making sense so far so good, I hope. Um, some more vocabulary when we talk about water. We say water acts as a very, very good solvent. It's a liquid and it is very good at dissolving things. Things that are getting dissolved, we call solutes. So uh, water is a good solvent that can dissolve solutes, can dissolve sugars, can dissolve salts, can dissolve uh, you know, different things. And anytime we have a mixture of a solute with a solvent, we have what we call a solution. So Kool-Aid is a solution, Gatorade is a solution, Iced tea is a solution. Our bodies are basically solutions, right? We have all these things, amino acids and proteins and um, sugars, all these things dissolved in our, in our blood plasma. So we are, uh, again, this walking solvent uh, type of container and all these solutes in there. So we are basically a, a mixture of things. We are a solution. Right? So... Uh, I'm going to use these terms often, right? Solutes, solvents, solutions. So just to kind of put things in perspective, right? Trying to tie in the idea of a um, ionic situation. So we have the here a salt crystal, let's say sodium, cation, chlorine, anion. So we have these salt crystals. We pour salt in water. Uh, if I was to ask a, a fifth grader, what, what happens when I add salt to water? Uh, I'm going to get certain fifth grade answers, right? but I'm hoping you're smarter than a fifth grader. Yeah? Uh, I hope you can explain to me why not just that salt dissolves, but why salt would dissolve in water. Right? What, what, what is it about water? What is it about the polarity of the, the bonds in water that allow water to act as a very, very good solvent? So it's kind of a little time-lapse idea here. So if you notice, so here we have that negative full ionic charge. We have that uh, full cationic charge here, but this blue circle is unable to attract the green circles anymore because of all the, in three dimensions, right? The delta negatives, it's not a good notation here, but delta negative charge, delta positive charge of the water, swarms around the individual uh, ions, right? And that's okay, right? The ions are stable. They're not gonna have a, a, a harmful significance in the body in moderate amounts. Uh, but that's, again, the why, right? Or, or the how. So how does water act as a solvent? Well, the polarity of water helps to go in there and break up any charged attraction, uh, of things that we eat, things in our, in our body. So it's an important biological reaction that, that we have. So again, so far so good. 
Now the last little bit here looking at acids and bases. So we cannot talk about acidity without first remembering water. And, and, and water is kind of in this uh, not nice relationship here. The uh, oxygen trying to steal hydrogen's electron, kind of battling, fighting. Eventually, oxygen wins the battle or eventually hydrogen gives up. Right? So if you've ever been fighting for something for a long time, eventually you say, you know what, it's not worth the battle, take it, it's yours. So hydrogen gives up its electron, oxygen gains the electron. So oxygen actually becomes then ionized. So we have an O and an H, but oxygen generates a negative anionic charge. Hydrogen lost its electron, so it gains that sort of lost its electron. It now ends up with a cationic positive charge. So um, a hydrogen with a cationic charge is not very happy. Can, can we envision a little proton with no electrons? So it's just a little angry proton that needs two electrons to be stable. So biologically, we are sort of concerned. We, we, we keep track, we monitor these little hydrogens. They are not stable, they are not happy, and they're gonna go in there and cause problems. They're gonna disrupt normal uh, electron configurations because they're trying to steal electrons. They can no longer share. They have no electrons to share. They can't uh, oxidize anymore. They have no more electrons to oxidize. So the only thing they can do is steal electrons to become stable. So again, we, we, we tend to, to keep track of these. And what that does or what that looks like now is this thing that we call the pH scale, the potential of the hydrogen cation concentration. That's what the pH scale measures. So how many of these little guys, these little angry little thieves, do we have in, 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 a, in an area, in, in a solution? So uh, the physicist and chemist did the work here. They established a range and uh, they made this scale. It goes from one to 14. And it's a negative logarithmic scale for you algebra lovers there. So it's a negative logarithmic scale. Uh, because it's logarithmic, it's based on powers of 10, right? So the small numbers actually have the most hydrogen cations. So the most hydrogen cations would be up here. The least hydrogen cations would be down here. Right? So uh, I should say down here. So the, here we have pH of seven. And if you notice, pH of seven is pure water. So the pH of seven, water is still with this little drama, but it's still water. Water has not ionized. It has not dissociated, broken apart. Right? So pH of seven is what's safe for the body. It's in the middle. Right? So we have pure water, blood uh, at around pH seven. So this is where we want to keep our, our body. If we start to look at situations that go away from seven towards the acidic realm, it gets stronger, 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 stronger acidity. Well, on the opposite side, we have a different problem. We don't call this a problem with acidity. We call it a problem with alkalinity, or sometimes they call it a basic situation, basis. So again, please don't sit here and memorize pH values and the substances they have, but just kind of be aware. Uh, the farther that we get from seven, the more hydrogen cations and the more potential for, for electrons to be disrupted can occur. Um, if you've ever, I don't know, got lemon juice in a, in a cut in your mouth or lemon juice in, in the eye, you know, it's things, hydrochloric acid, stomach acid, it's, it's amazing how we have that in our body, it's so strong, but it decomposes, it, it breaks down, destroys, breaks apart the, the food that we eat. So it's, a, it's an interesting mechanism that, that we use there. As we go again, farther from seven, if you ever had to clean an oven, that's pretty nasty. Bleach, uh, if you get that on your clothes, it damages the clothes. If you get it in your, in your you know, splash it in your eyes, you go to a swimming pool that has too much chlorine, uh, not very fun, right? So the moral of the story, we want to be around pH of seven. If we, our body starts to be exposed with substances farther away from seven, uh, it can potentially be uh, dangerous there. So. 
pH of seven, that neutrality area, important. Uh, in chemistry, you get into more detail. Why is this an acid? Why is this a base? Uh, I'm not going to get into that discussion. Just again, understand we want to be around seven. We don't want to linger too long in areas that the pH value is, is farther from seven there. So with that, finally, long chapter, took me a while to get through that. Um, at this point, I will be able to start progressing a little bit more rapidly uh, through, these, uh, through these discussions. But uh, that will conclude our discussion now on chapter two. Uh, you now should have all the materials required for uh, the homework that is due on Wednesday night. So tomorrow night, 11.59 p.m. So uh, look for these videos to be uploaded. Keep an eye out for now chapter three videos to f follow. Um, I hope to maybe do a Zoom meeting, uh, a live Zoom meeting tomorrow. I'll let you know what time. Uh, I'll send an email, so keep an eye out for that. So if you have any specific questions that, you know, you're just not being able to communicate through the emails and you, you need to speak face-to-face, -face, uh, we can try it that way. So keep an eye out for a Zoom meeting tomorrow. I uh, don't know what time, maybe in the early afternoon sometime. And um, we'll see. We'll see how that works out. I'm not an expert on this just yet, so please be patient with, with those uh, errors on my part as well. So, again, with that, I conclude Chapter 2. So let me start loading these, and you all have a good rest of your day.